chair that in mind. And today it is health and sport. Question number one, Peter Chapman. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to support NHS Grampian and reduce the board's waiting times. Shona Robson. NHS Grampian are using the £4.9 million from the £50 million we made available to boards in the current financial year to address long waits across the whole patient pathway, including in specialties such as orthopaedics and ophthalmology. NHS Grampian uh, have... Uh, all received, uh, has received £470,000 of the £4.85 million cancer funding released in 1718. This funding has been provided to ensure cancer patients are continued to be prioritised and treated within the expected waiting times wherever clinically possible. This revenue is being targeted to increase scope and diagnostic and imaging capacity. Peter Chapman. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer but for the past nine months NHS Grampian has had the worst waiting times in Scotland. In that time over 18,000 people have waited over 18 weeks for treatment. Core revenue expenditure for NHS Grampian is the second lowest in Scotland with a spend per head of only £1,671. Does the Cabinet Secretary admit this is unacceptable and will she apologise to the people of Grampian? Shona Robson. Uh, in 2018-19, NHS Grampian's resource budget will be £920.6 million. That's an uplift of 2.1% compared to 2017-18, which is the highest of any territorial NHS board. Uh, what I should say, though, is that situation uh, would, would be worse uh, if we were to apply the Tory tax plans, which would have taken 49 Point five million pounds out of uh, Grampian's uh, resource uh, budget. So uh, it really doesn't behold uh, the member to come here complaining about Grampian's resource budget when he would have taken almost 50 million pounds out of that as had, had his plans gone ahead. No, Supplementary to Liam MacArthur. Deputy President, obviously, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware the um, waiting times not only affect those in the Grampian region, but also um, those uh, covered by the island health boards, including uh, Orkney. Can she update the Parliament on what discussions she or her officials have had with NHS Orkney about the additional investment going into NHS Grampian and how that meets the needs of island patients from Orkney and indeed from Shetland? Shona Robson. Well, as uh, Lee McArthur will be uh, aware that uh, the involvement of both Orkney and Shetland in those discussions is very important because as he knows very well many of uh, his constituents will uh, rely on the services of NHS Grampian uh, for procedures um, that cannot be carried out on those the islands so the resources that have gone and of course Orkney and Shetland would have will have also received their share of the, the £50 million waiting times initiative as well as NHS Grampian. What I would expect, uh, and I know is happening very much in the, the north uh, of Scotland, is that boards are working together uh, to maximise uh, collaboration, to make sure that they can shorten the patient journey, to share resources. And where there are, for, for example, shortages of particular specialist staff, uh, that uh, they look for uh, north-wide solutions in order to, to try and recruit those specialist staff. So uh, that uh, work has been uh, led very well by uh, Malcolm Wright and very happy to write to the member with more detail if he'd find that helpful. Supplementary, Richard Lockhead. Uh, whilst welcoming the extra cash for NHS Grampian, can I draw the Cabinet Secretary's attention to the growing frustration being expressed by the campaign group AFASAIR in terms of the long waiting times for pain clinics, particularly in Murray, given that people don't want to have to travel to uh, Aberdeen all the time for treatment. And can she investigate this and perhaps provide an update both to myself and directly to the campaign group Afisir. And one member of the campaign group, Brenda Carnegie, was quoted in the Press and Journal this week saying that Can you come to she's conclusions, been waiting for nearly two years for injections she should get every six months, if she could perhaps investigate these issues as well, please. Shona Robson. I'm happy to do that and to get back to the, the member. What I will say is that nationally, almost three quarters of patients referred to a pain clinic were seen within the 18 week standard. That's a significant increase in the previous quarter, but of course there was too much local variation uh, across boards, something that we want to uh, eradicate. Uh, I uh, can assure you that the, the government is very much committed to ensuring all patients, no matter where they live, have swift access to 
full range of services that they need. Uh, I'm aware that waiting times are longer than we would expect in NHS Grampian. They have had significant staff absences in the past year that has affected this area. I know that there's been recent recruitment that's been successful and has enabled additional clinics to be offered. But in terms of what the member was asking uh, around the, the pain clinics in Murray, happy to look into that and get back to him. Supplementary, Lewis MacDonald. Given that early diagnosis can make the difference between successful and unsuccessful treatment for diseases such as cancer, uh, and given I know the Cabinet Secretary will agree with Cancer Research UK on the importance of early diagnosis and investigation, can she tell us what specific steps she will take to reduce waiting times for diagnosis and investigation uh, for patients with such diseases in Grampian? Shona Robson. So obviously, uh, Lewis McDonald will be aware of the, the work uh, being taken forward by the, the cancer strategy, which is uh, looking to improve cancer services across Scotland. As I said in my initial answer, NHS Grampian uh, has received uh, £470,000 of the £4.85 million cancer funding released last year. And that the focus of that money has been very much in increasing scope and diagnostic and imaging capacity. Uh, that will continue uh, to be our focus. We know that once uh, a person is diagnosed, actually their journey from then on to treatment is very short. So it's the diagnostic pathway that we need to shorten. Uh, he might also be aware that I chair a national group of the very best experts in this field that are looking at the best practice because there is, again, still variation around that diagnostic pathway. And uh, we're looking at making sure that we can do everything possible uh, to shorten that uh, diagnostic pathway. I'm happy to keep the member appraised of any detail. Question number two, Mark Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when details of the fund to support parents of premature babies in hospitals will be announced. Shona Robson. Uh, we're pleased to announce that the neonatal expenses fund will go live on the 1st of April and will be available to families of all babies in neonatal care. We've worked with NHS boards and the neonatal charity Bliss to develop a clear and simple scheme which is universally accessible and I've written to all boards this week to outline the details and I want to record uh, the, the members' uh, active interest in pursuance of this issue as well which is uh, well understood and uh, um, certainly very welcome. Mark Griffin. I'd like to thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer and the work that has gone in to set up this fund. I'm delighted to say that it will start on my daughter Rosa's first birthday. Um, but can I ask the Cabinet Secretary... <laughs> can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what levels of support uh, the, the fund will provide each day and whether there are uh, daily limits? Um, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware that there will be babies um, born before the 1st of April and still be in a hospital um, after this point and just an assurance that uh, babies born earlier than the 1st of April this year will be able to access the fund and just to ask um, how the fund will, use of the fund will be tracked throughout um, the year and what provisions are in place um, if the fund is exhausted within the financial year. Shona Robson. Uh, I think it's very appropriate that this uh, fund is launched on ba Baby Rosa's uh, birthday. Uh, I, I can't think of anything more appropriate. Uh, can I say to the member that the fund will support uh, parents with travel costs, uh, parking uh, and uh, meals. Uh, I can tell him that um, we will be uh, making it very easy for people uh, to, to claim. So uh, a leaflet and a copy of the claim form will be given to families when their baby is admitted to a neonatal unit. In addition, there's, there's posters advertising the scheme uh, to make sure people are aware of it. Uh, I think we also, it's important that we review and monitor it to see whether there's any adjustments that are required. Uh, so we'll review the scheme after six months and at the end of the first year to evaluate the provision and we can consider whether there's any changes to the scheme uh, that might be necessary. And of course, we'd want to hear from parents uh, in that regard who are using it. Um, in terms of those uh, prior to the 1st of April, what I'll do is I'll write to the member with that information because I want to be accurate about that. Um, but I'm happy to uh, generally uh, keep the member uh, informed of, of this and the detail going forward, given his active interest. Uh, straight to quick questions, please. Philip McGregor, followed by Miles Briggs. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Cabinet Secretary what engagement 
the Scottish Government's had with the UK Government regarding the extension of maternity leave and statutory maternity pay for parents of pre premature or sick babies. And just to remind the Chamber that I'm the PLO to the Cabinet Secretary. Shona Robson. Uh, well, Fulton McGregor raises a, an important point about um, additional support that families in this situation would no doubt uh, welcome. Um, I am aware that in September of this year, at the request of the Business Minister, Margot James, that ACAS pu published a new guidance for employers to help them support staff who have given birth to premature or very sick babies. I certainly welcome this move to provide information to information to parents on their rights and to employers on how best to support and uh, hope uh, that this will have some positive results for uh, parents. The Scottish Government supports uh, this proposal. I believe it also has been raised um, by the neonatal charity Bliss and uh, we certainly um, will be working with our colleagues with responsibility for childcare and early years and social security uh, to make sure that we keep pressure on the UK Government to do its bit. Miles Briggs. Thank you, and could I um, start by paying tribute to Mark Griffin in helping to secure the £1.5 million fund for parents of premature babies. Alongside the fund, the Health Secretary announced in December that she was working with health boards to ensure there's su sufficient and free accommodation for all parents whose premature babies are in hospital. Can she update Parliament on the progress has, which has been made on that front? Shona Robson. Yes, um, all boards have some provision for accommodation where there is a need for family to stay. Uh, 14 out of the 15 units currently offer accommodation for parents within their unit and 11 others offer accommodation elsewhere within the hospital. We're working with boards and that continues to ensure that there is sufficient free of charge accommodation available to all parents who need this. So progress being made but there's still some progress yet to be made. Question number three, Mark Ruskell. Thank you. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what analysis the Health Secretary has made of the potential implications for Scotland of the findings in the recent annual report of the Chief Medical Officer for England, which addressed the impact on public health of pollution. Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Um, we welcome the broad ranging and thorough report from the Chief Medical Officer for England, work by the Scottish Government, our partners and stakeholders to deliver environmental protection and improvement is supported by Scottish specific advice from the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland and Health Protection Scotland. Many of the issues identified in the report have relevance to Scotland and Health Protection Scotland will consider the findings in detail to add to the evidence-based directing work that is taking place, for example, through cleaner air for Scotland to reduce the burden of disease from pollution in this country. Matt Ruskell. Can I thank the Minister for that response? One of the main findings of the report is that we simply don't know what the combined effects are of different forms of pollutants, such as noise, light and air, and the impact that can have then on health inequalities. These are all issues that greatly concern my constituents who live in the shadow of the Moss Moran plant in Fife. So will the Minister um, support calls for a long-term health study into the combination effects of these different forms of pollutants around the Moss Moran site. Aileen Campbell. Um, well, I think, you know, in recognising that the Chief Medical Officer's report for, for England was uh, broad ranging, uh, it identified a number of those uh, areas that he, uh, Mark Ruskell, articulates around noise, light and air. There are work, there is work currently carrying, being carried out on a number of those issues already in Scotland and happily will take any uh, concerns that his constituents have into account, happy to meet with the, the member if that would help, if he wanted to kind of further elaborate on some of the specific concerns that his constituents have. But the three issues that he raised are noise, light and air. There are, there is, there are, work, there are work happening right across those uh, areas and we can continue to make improvements where we need to. Supplementary to David Stewart. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be well aware that air pollution from particulate matter is responsible for 2,000 early deaths in Scotland each year, and exposure to nitrogen di dioxide in PM 2.5 causes 2,500 premature deaths each year, according to Royal College of Physicians. Does the Minister share my view that those least responsible for air pollution are the worst affected and that are the most vulnerable in our society? Does the Minister share my view that the action required is urgent rollout of low admission zones, additional funding for active travel and bus regulation? Aileen Campbell. 
Um, I thank Dave Stewart for his uh, question. Uh, there are, as he knows, a number of uh, actions being taken forward by government on a range of the, the, the issues that Dave Stewart uh, outlines. We are, as a country, meeting both domestic and European air quality targets across much of Scotland, but we understand and recognise that there are hotspots of poorer air quality in a number of the urban areas. And he's right to identify the inequality that's linked to some of those uh, who are most impacted by that. We have set more stringent air quality targets than the rest of the UK, and Scotland is the first country in Europe to legislate for a particulate matter, uh, a pollutant that is of special concern for human health. Uh, we also have uh, money and resources that are uh, attributed to the efforts that we want to do, and not least the low emission zones, which uh, the Cabinet Secretary announced um, uh, fairly recently. So there are a number of areas in which we're taking forward progress in recognition of the fact that this does have an impact and can have an impact on uh, people's quality of life. And therefore, we need to endeavour across portfolios uh, to make sure that we can alleviate that as best we can. Can I ask members to be a bit more succinct with their questions and, and indeed ministers to be a bit more succinct with their answers and that way more people can get in with supplementaries. Question number four, Alison Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it has made rolling out the healthier, wealthier children approach to income maximisation across Scotland. Aileen Campbell. Thank you. The Scottish Government remains committed to embedding across all NHS boards healthier, wealthier children's key principles of health and advice services, joining up to ensure pregnant women and families have access to financial advice when they need it. To progress this, we asked NHS Health Scotland to carry out a scoping exercise which ran between March and October last year with all NHS boards to establish their current position with the embedding of health and advice service referral pathways. This exercise showed that while a number of boards have formalised referral pathways, some are at an earlier stage in their journey. NHS Health Scotland have established a short life subgroup of Scotland's Health Promotion Managers Group to make recommendations to the Scottish Government on next steps to ensure all boards establish pathways. We expect to receive these recommendations in April uh, this year and will consider them carefully to inform our next steps. Um, I Alison Johnson. Thank the Minister for her response. Our research suggests that based on the success of Healthier Wealthier Children in 2012, rolling this programme out across Scotland would lead to gains of at least £9.4 million for pregnant women and families in the greatest need. And the evidence that we have clearly suggests this helps improve health and reduce inequalities. The Minister has made the point there um, very clearly that can we reach path the question, please, Mr. referral Johnson. pathways are key. So can I ask the Minister to be specific about what additional resourcing will be put in place to deliver these pledges? How much cash will the government you know, use to fund this rollout? Thank you. Aileen Campbell. Okay, and I think that analysis that Alison Johnson uh, outlines uh, shows the compelling need to make sure that this can uh, happen. That's why it's important that we had that understanding about this, the, uh, the situation across the country. Um, the Child Poverty Delivery Plan will be essential in progressing healthier, wealthier children, which will enable uh, resources to help progress the, uh, this important programme. I'm not in a position to outline exactly that, uh, that funding. However, uh, we will uh, endeavour to ensure that the member is kept up to date because uh, she is right to articulate that by spending a little we can potentially save many people and many families a lot and help reduce inequalities. Question number five, Rachel Hamilton. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle health inequalities and what role having access to arts and culture can play in this. Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Um, reducing health inequalities is one of the biggest challenges we face. They are a symptom of wider social inequalities, and that's why we're focusing on the underlying causes that drive health inequalities, ending poverty, fair wages, supporting families, and improving our physical and social environments. The government uh, is working in collaboration with individuals, communities, and organisations across Scotland to develop a culture strategy that will set out a vision and priorities for the future development of culture in Scotland, enabling everyone to have the opportunity to take part or uh, contribute to cultural life in Scotland. We know that people who engage with and participate in cultural activities report better health outcomes, and we are seeking to better embed arts and culture into health and care settings. And many organisations working in the arts, such as the Scottish Mental Health Arts Festival, are recognising the health benefits that they can bring to their audiences. Rachel Hamilton. 
Minister for that answer. And Aileen Campbell is right that the Scottish Government found that participation in culture is significantly linked to good health and high life satisfaction in Scotland. In fact, Cabinet Secretary uh, Fiona Hislop said starting young and, and being encouraged to take part in culture as a child makes it more likely that benefits of taking part will be experienced as an adult. And as such, does the Minister agree with me that recent decisions concerning the Scottish Youth Theatre and other services has the potential to damage the nation's health? And will she agree that more needs to be done to increase access, especially for young people, to arts and culture throughout Scotland to improve health outcomes? Aileen Campbell. I absolutely concur with the sentiments expressed by uh, the Cabinet Secretary that if we enable young people to participate in the arts and culture that they are more likely to be able to enjoy that in later life. The same goes perhaps for, for sport and similarly to sport that's why we have uh, endeavoured to ensure that we can offset the cuts from the UK National Lottery which has threatened many of our uh, cultural and sporting organisations that enable young people to participate in the arts and culture and I recognise as well the ongoing and a very a topical issue around the Scottish Youth Theatre uh, and I understand that there are, are continued to be discussions on that issue to ensure that that very much loved and well respected organisation can uh, ensure some sort of in sustainable future. Elaine Smith, supplementary. Thank you, President Officer. As the Minister seems aware that the health inequalities, including inequalities in mental health, are often a symptom of poverty, will she commit to the government addressing the shortfall in funding for other local community projects which give more deprived communities an opportunity to engage in arts and culture activities? Elaine Campbell. Yeah, um, again, I'm probably, uh, I would imagine that my uh, colleague uh, Fiona Hislop would have uh, more to say and can uh, certainly direct some of the uh, information that maybe Aline uh, seeks to, to the culture department. However, as I said in my previous response to Rachel Hamilton, what we have done to try and protect some of uh, our cultural organisers is, is to offset the cuts that have been experienced through the UK lottery, which has uh, threatened many uh, organisations that have uh, relied upon that revenue source. The same again, the same story that we experienced uh, in sports. So uh, I think it was important that the Scottish Government stepped in to offset those uh, reductions. Uh, and we recognise, as I said in my original answer, that we do recognise that inequalities are something we want to check, and uh, want to reduce, we want to reverse, we want to make sure that many young people get the opportunity to participate in arts and culture and that's why it's important that we uh, continue to press the National Lottery to uh, make sure that there is a, an adequate uh, strategy to reduce the fall in revenues there. Question number six, Rona Mackay. To ask the Scottish Government how the NHS monitors children diagnosed with foetal alcohol syndrome. Aileen Campbell. Thank you. Thank you. The Scottish Government funds NHS uh, Scotland to provide a range of services to promote and protect the health of children. Hospital, general practice and nursing services provide ongoing health care to children diagnosed with long-term medical conditions such as fetal alcohol syndrome. In July 2017, we launched the Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorder Care Pathway, which is an e-learning resource for health professionals which aim to help the, with the diagnosis of the condition and support the families and carers of affected children. Rona Mackay. Minister for the answer. In Scotland we have benefited from the supports needs system which allows for the recording of children with diverse types of health needs including those resulting from foetal alcohol syndrome and this system is currently being reviewed. Does the minister agree with me that it's important to have an interconnected system throughout Scotland and will the review consider a single data recording system rather than one fragmented into health board areas? Ailey Campbell. Mackay is absolutely right to point to the fact that we need a uh, consistency uh, in terms of the way in which we uh, diagnose and, and record incidences of uh, foetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, health boards record the uh, diagnosis of conditions on their local information systems and the FASD care pathway which we launched last July provides all health professionals with the necessary information to help with the diagnostic and support process. There is also a multidisciplinary uh, professional sign group looking specifically assessment and diagnosis of foetal alcohol syndrome and this is due to report by the end of this year and will certainly ensure that the points and uh, issues raised by Rona Mackay around the consistency of diagnosis uh, is part of that work. Quick supplementary please Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you Deputy Presiding Officer. I ask this on behalf uh, of a constituent of mine who is asking what the process is following the birth of children with foetal alcohol syndrome and perhaps the effects of opiates from a social care intervention perspective and child protection perspective. Aileen Campbell. Yeah, um, 
The prevalence of uh, fetal alcohol uh, syndrome is uh, very complex and there's not a single treatment for fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which it does vary in its presentation and its severity, but it is also recognised as a lifelong condition. Um, there is no evidence that early intervention support, for example, to enhance learning and manage self-regulation and behaviour can be beneficial. This involves early enrolment with uh, relevant educational resources and other agencies such as social and psychological services. Enhanced awareness and recognition of FASD and adopting the Getting It Right for Every Child approach to support families can optimise the long-term management of FASD. Again, though, if the uh, member would like to write to me with the specifics around his constituent, happy to kind of take that uh, further. Question number seven, Morris Corey. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making with the clinical review of cancer waiting times and when the results will be published. Shona Robson. <clears throat> the clinical review of cancer access standards in Scotland provides uh, an excellent opportunity to examine how information on cancer waiting times could be best used to modify and enhance the patient experience. It will determine if any amendments or modifications are required to ensure the cancer waiting time standards best meet the needs of patients and the NHS for the future. A wide range of views from stakeholders, including patients, the public, primary and secondary care clinicians, data staff and third sector organisations have been collated to help formulate the review recommendations. These recommendations are being finalised with a view to publication in the spring of this year. Maurice Corey. Uh, thank, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. Uh, would the Cabinet Secretary be able to describe what actions are actually being considered as part of the clinical review of cancer waiting times targets to minimise inequalities of service across the health boards and to ensure that those missing the target are given the support needed to improve performance? And, the review, and will the review be looking at the areas which have been suggested by Cancer Research UK? Shona Robson. Well, um, I think it is... First of all, about making sure that the, the targets we have are fit for purpose and then looking at what adjustments, if any, uh, need to be made. So uh, there's wide clinical agreement broadly that the existing 62-day and 31-day standards have been crucial in driving performance and patient care, although there's still uh, some uh, improvement yet to be made. Uh, but also it, it's looking at things like pathway complexity, um, and making sure that that's understood because for some cancers that pathway is more complex and whether those targets uh, are appropriate in those circumstances and also whether for cancer uh, types whether some of those should be uh, within the targets because as he'll be aware not all are so I don't want to prejudge what the recommendations are but it has definitely the right people uh, looking at this and I'm very confident that whatever those recommendations are it will help us to uh, make the improvement that will help to uh, ensure that our cancer services are fit for purpose for the future. Question number eight, Jackie Bailey. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to reduce ambulance waiting times. Shona Robson. The service has undertaken a number of measures to look at ways that they can further improve response times to calls from patients and healthcare professionals requesting an ambulance. They are also looking to improve pathways for patients to ensure they receive the most appropriate clinical response uh, to meet their needs. The service is committed to ensuring it continues to deliver a high quality level of emergency health care to the people of Scotland and the Scottish Government continues to support the service as they take forward this work. Jackie Bailey. <clears throat> Stituent Elizabeth Clayton is 100 years old, registered blind and lives in Renton, which is minutes away from the Vale of Leven Hospital. She became ill at 2pm. Her doctor called for an ambulance to take her to the Vale. No ambulance appeared despite phone calls from the family. And at 10pm that same day, the call was upgraded to a 999 emergency. The ambulance eventually arrived at 1 a.m., 11 hours after it was first called. Will the Cabinet Secretary apologise to Mrs Clayton, who waited 11 hours in considerable pain? And what action will she take to support our dedicated paramedics by increasing the capacity of our ambulance service? Shona Robson. Well, can I first say to Jackie Bailey, I would expect in a case like that, the Scottish Ambulance Service would be investigating. Um, if she hasn't already passed it on to the Scottish Ambulance Service, then she should. I would also want to see the details of that case. And of course, I would apologise to Mrs Clayton uh, for that. Uh, I would also want to know the, the context of, of when this happened, because I should, Jackie Bailey will be aware of some of the, uh, the challenges over the, the winter period um, that the Scottish Ambulance Service faced. But 
for Mrs Clayton that uh, uh, would, uh, is no consolation. So I would want to look into the details of that case uh, in, in, uh, uh, as soon as possible. Can I say to her, I'm sure Jackie Bailey will be uh, aware that we have increased funding to the Scottish Ambulance Service to strengthen the workforce with the recruitment of a further 224 paramedics this year in line with the commitment to see a thousand more paramedics recruited uh, by the end of 2021. She will also be aware that uh, in addition to the response in the emergency uh, vehicles, uh, uh, she will be aware that there is also uh, a lot of training of community paramedics going on who will be able to see and treat people within their own homes where that is appropriate. So uh, if you I could come say to, to Jack Bailey, if she could furnish me the details of the case, I'll make sure it's fully investigated. Question number nine, Mike Rumbles. To ask the Scottish Government, in light of information provided by the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, suggesting that NHS Grampian has been underfunded by £165.6 million since 2008, whether it plans to provide additional funding to meet this long-term shortfall. Shona Robson. I'll repeat the response I provided in this chamber to Mike Rumbles on the 24th of January this year. NHS Grampian will receive a resource budget uplift of 2.1% in 2018-19, the highest percentage uplift of any territorial board. This includes £5 million share of additional NRAC parity funding and takes the board's annual resource budget to £921 million. Over a seven-year period, the Scottish Government has invested an additional £1.2 billion in supporting those boards that are below their NRAC parity levels. In 2018-19, all boards will be within 0.8% of NRAC parity, and that's the first time that has been the case. Mike Rumbles. The Minister will be aware of the shocking report published yesterday highlighting that over a quarter of patients who suffer chronic pain disorders have been forced to wait longer than 18 weeks for treatment. And once again, NHS Grampian has the worst results for Scotland, with 542 people waiting desperately as the deadline for treatment has come and gone. Does the Minister now agree with me that 10 years of underfunding have left NHS Grampian unable to deliver the same level of service that is received by patients in the rest of Scotland, and it doesn't help just repeating an, an answer from January. Shona Robson. Oh, but the answer from January is factually correct. That's why I repeated it, because I think facts matter. And NHS Grampian has received the highest percentage uplift of any territorial board, and they are, are within 0.8% of NRAC parity. Now, earlier on, I uh, said that the chronic pain waiting times had uh, significantly improved uh, this quarter from last quarter, but there was local variation. That local variation uh, is for both uh, N those above NRAC parity and those below NRAC parity. So if you look at Ayrshire and Arran, for example, they have work to do as well. So I, I think to link this uh, to the issue of, of NRAC parity uh, is, is not correct. What well, NHS Graham need to do and are doing uh, is recruiting the staff they need to do to provide the clinics. Had Mike Rumbles listened to my earlier answer, he would have heard me say that NHS Grampian have had difficulties recruiting the staff to staff the clinics. They have been on a recruitment campaign and have had some success in that. So that's not a money issue. That is about the ability to recruit staff. Perhaps if Mike Rumbles met with NHS Grampian more often, he might get the detail that he requires. Question number 10, Andy Whiteman. The Scottish Government, what discussions the Health Secretary has had with the Housing Minister regarding action that can be taken to mitigate the cost of health inequalities brought about by poor or unsuitable housing? Aileen Campbell. Ministers and officials have discussions on a wide range of issues aimed at tackling health and social inequality. I've met with the Minister for Local Government and Housing regarding ways we can collaboratively create a fairer and healthier Scotland. For instance, a new fuel poverty strategy and warm house bill will contribute to a number of government objectives and will help to improve outcomes across Scotland. Its overarching ambition is to see a Scotland where everyone li lives in a warm home, has sufficient income for healthy living, has access to affordable low carbon energy and has the skills to make appropriate use of energy. Andy Whiteman. I thank the Minister for the answer. Year-on-year -year increases in housing costs mean that housing affordability for many people remain a key driver of inequalities, particularly for people uh, in areas where there's a chronic shortage of affordable housing. We know that NHS could save around 60 million a year in preventative savings if investments were made in 
affordable housing. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that compared to England and Wales, we have inadequate data on the effectiveness of investment in housing to improve health? And does she also agree that housing is a key health intervention for many, many people? Aileen Campbell. Yeah. Absolutely, um, and that's why I continue to work with uh, my colleague Kevin Stewart because of the real impact the housing, good quality uh, housing has on health outcomes and in, help, in terms of uh, helping to reduce um, health and social inequalities. And that's why this government has invested considerably uh, in terms of uh, housing over the last parliamentary term. 33,000, over 33,000 affordable homes were delivered, uh, 22, over 22,000 for social rent. Uh, the, the, the ambitions continue with uh, more money being put in to ensure that we can uh, achieve our uh, our desire to reach 50,000 affordable homes over the lifetime of this parliament, a 76% increase on our previous five-year investment. So this government takes housing incredibly uh, importantly because of the allied health benefits and associated uh, ways in which it can help us tackle inequality. Happy to engage with the member further, but certainly I know that this government and uh, myself and Kevin Stewart remain committed to ensuring that we can create a healthier Scotland and a fairer Scotland by ensuring that we continue to meet those ambitious uh, targets we've set and which are been delivered on. Question number 11, Jackson Carlaw. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government when the Health Secretary last met with the Chief Executive of NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde and what issues were discussed. Shona Robson. Ministers and government officials meet regularly with representatives of all boards, including NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, to discuss matters of importance to local people. Jackson Carlo. With local authority, new local plans, uh, local authorities very often resolve new housing demands. Uh, with, the, but with, with the provision of major new estates. However, councils themselves can provide for future education needs, but community health care partnerships have to try and anticipate future health provision with GP services. Is the Cabinet Secretary satisfied that the process underpinning that is sufficiently robust and well-resourced, particularly where a major new estate is created and when the existing lists within GPs are at full capacity, as is currently the case in a particular example within my own Eastwood constituency? Shona Robson. Uh, I think the, the member makes a, an important point. Um, the fact that we now have uh, the health and, and care partnerships uh, working uh, across uh, health uh, and social care, bringing in uh, a housing element uh, to those discussions as well. I think there, there is the need to make sure that when new house building is taking place, that the local services required to um, provide those uh, services, including health services and primary care services uh, to those uh, residents, that that is taken into account when looking at uh, future planning. We would expect our partners to be doing that. Um, if, if there's more we can do uh, in that space to make sure that that is done at an early enough time, because as he will appreciate, um, expanding any health services takes time. And there can sometimes be a mismatch uh, with uh, the, the planning process and then the, the house building process. So I'm happy to uh, communicate further with Jackson Carlaw on that matter if he'd find that helpful. Question number 12, Claire Big. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what assistance it can provide to Cowdenbeath FC with its Club 135 campaign, Honour the Past and Shoot a Future, which aims to secure the future of the club. Aileen Campbell. Thank you. I'm aware of the good work being carried out in support of Cowdenbeath's uh, Club 135 complaint. I know the club has strong and deep roots, now dating back more than 135 years in the town. Like many football clubs at all levels in Scotland, Cowdenbeath is an important part of the local community and I'm encouraged by the spirit shown by both the club supporters and wider community to raise £135,000 to help build a sustainable future. And I've instructed my officials to contact the club directly to discuss the campaign in more detail. Claire Baker. A very minister's response, and as the minister recognises, the club is 137 years old, and it is very important to the local community, but the club no longer has the large mining community that it used to have for its support, and the rent from the weekly market and the stock cars no longer comes to the club as it lost its ownership of Central Park. Um, an emergency general meeting and a public meeting had to recently be cancelled because of the snow, but the club is clearly in a mode of fighting for survival. Um, I welcome the Minister's commitment that officials will contact the club and will she also join with me in calling for locals and football lovers in the world all over to help save the club. 
Aileen Campbell. Thank you, and happy to uh, lend my uh, name to that call for uh, people to get behind the club's campaign. Fans and uh, are the lifeblood of, of Scottish football, and certainly if anyone can uh, make uh, the difference to this club, then I know it will be the club's uh, supporters. Uh, happy also to continue to meet with the member on the back of our officials' meeting with Cowden Beef Football Club and to uh, do what we can to raise awareness of the, the efforts of the supporters. That concludes general questions. And whilst I still have half a minute left, can I, can I say something about the slot? Um, presiding officers try very hard to, to give a balance when we're doing portfolio questions uh, in terms of supplementaries. And I have seen a few grumpy faces around the chamber this afternoon. Um, however, there, there's also got to be a respect for those who have questions submitted and have taken time uh, with their supplementary questions. So that has to be borne in mind as well. And also to be borne in mind, um, when people take far too long, um, it does mean that we can't take some of their colleagues. And I would ask ministers to reflect on that as well in relation to their answers. Thank you very much. Give a couple of moments for people to get themselves settled.